Uh, bon dia, uh, good morning. Uh, let me introduce Professor Shaw. Uh, he received his uh, degree on physics at the Yunnan University in, in, in China. And in 1994, uh, he received his PhD at the Institute of High Energy Physics in, in Beijing. After that, he moved to United, the United States and he, uh, as a, at the University of Oregon, as a research associate, uh, where he worked on theoretic uh, adron and heavy, uh, and heavy ion physics. Then, in 1998, uh, he joined uh, the, the, the highest collaboration, working in ultra-high energy cosmic rays and, and, uh, in Utah. And, uh, and also in 2003, uh, he, promote, he was promoted to as associate professor at the University of Utah. Uh, the next year, in 2004, uh, he was uh, promoted as full professor at the, at the Institute of High Energy Physics in, in Beijing. And also he was the deputy director of the Particle Astrophysical Laboratory and uh, he is also the spokesperson of the Argo uh, experiment and also is the principal investigator, investigator the DPI of the, La, La, of the Lagasso project. Uh, uh, his interest in, in a science is focused uh, in, three, in three topics related uh, between them. One is the study of energy cosmic ray physics above 10 to 14 electron volts, uh, so to above the, 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 the first knee in the, in the Compton ray spectrum. Also, uh, he's involved in the high energy uh, gamma ray astronomy uh, with Argo and also with the La Hasso experiment. And also, he is interested, he is working in ultra high energy tau neutrino searching above 10 to 15 electron volts. Uh, in the talk of today, uh, as uh, we are working mainly in our group in high energy gamma ray astrophysics, uh, he will focus mainly in the impressive results obtained by La Hasso in the last month, uh, just detecting many pebatrons and sources that uh, before that uh, were just so from a theoretical point of view, not, a real, not, not real sources. And also, uh, just as uh, the last week, just uh, there was an impacting result obtained by La Hasso, so he will make some comments about that. So this instrument is uh, today maybe open a new window to the universe just in the highest gamma ray photons. And the highest gamma ray astronomy is a new window, so it's detecting many sources that were unexpected and uh, just... Uh, uh, are uh, facing new theoretical debate about how to interpret this high energy mission. So, uh, please, uh, Dr. Zhao, uh, you can start when you want. Thank you very much. Oof. Is that a volume control? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm very glad to have uh, this chance to be here. Thank uh, Maria's uh, invitation for me to, to come here. Uh -huh. uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph, okay, <laughs> very nice, okay. Uh, so today, before I come to this uh, uh, topics, I want to show you uh, something really interesting. That just happened uh, last week, okay. Before, uh, when I visited uh, uh, Florence and uh, some guys called me, you, you should look at your data. Probably there was something that's really uh, surprising. So that was the time just past midnight of China. And then I sent the email to my, uh, 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 to, to my colleagues. 
uh, say just uh, when whenever you just once you wake up, you, uh, wake wake up, then they just look at the data. Okay. Then at the four a.m. in the morning, they tell us they tell me there was something really big. Okay. How big it is? This is the strongest uh, uh, gamma ray burst ever happened in our in uh, in, in the universe detected by us. Um, very, very lucky. You see, this is a field of view at that moment of this detector. Uh, basically, it's a five degree as the, you know, this control with the distance. And here is the zenith of the our detector. Why it happened just 28 degrees from the zenith, which is almost perfect to catch this guy. Okay, that's very, very lucky. And then uh, we look at the, into how many events we have. And eventually, second days, they told me more than 50,000, actually it's 80,000 photons measured by, this, by, the, by the detector. That's enormous. Never, never happened to this before at such a high energy. And uh, this, uh, the threshold energy is something that's around the 300 GeV. The significance is greater than 130 sigma. This is in incredible, right? This is some number very, very shocking. And then the, the, the highest energy photon reached to something like 18 TeV. This uh, another breaking things. So people now in the world, they are trying to, you know, making a lot of theories about how this 18 TeV photons can come down from the distance, like uh, uh, with the Z, the redshift is the 0 0.15, the distance. So this is a big issue, okay? Basically, this is the you know the signal that we saw. See, this is uh, if you have something like the 130 sigma, the picture looks like this for a point source. Okay, basically the the size of this guy just show you what is our angular resolution. So that's just that. Then uh, let's go back to uh, uh, this uh, uh, experiment itself, and I want to tell you something about the status of this experiment currently. And also uh, showing, uh, sharing some uh, uh, results recently we got. Basically, that is about the onset of so-called ultra high energy gamma ray astronomy. Okay, because this detector opened the window, started from the 100 TeV. Um, then uh, we used some uh, techniques. Um, some technology is really interesting. Maybe share to uh, our colleagues here if this is interesting to you. Uh, since we are talking about uh, very narrow things about the uh, astronomy, so I want to make it this, uh, you know, more introduction level stuff at the, at the beginning. So the question is why do we interested about the origin of cosmic rays? The cosmic ray, we know, we already know this stuff since uh, you know, 1912 which is already one, 106 years uh, past. But uh, we still don't know what is, where are those guys coming from. Yeah, this is a big issue. Why this is uh, so interesting? Let's take a look of the, the energy of those guys, okay? We know the highest energy we produced by human beings at the sun, just not far away from here. And uh, uh, by using the 27 kilometers of tunnel pipelines, to accelerate the particles. Then we reach the energy, something like a 7 TeV for proton, okay? This energy, let's take a round of the number to a 10, 10 to the 13 EV, that's as human beings can, can do with such a big efforts with the, so many people from the world, yeah, to do this kind of job. However, the highest energy of a cosmic ray we measured from my experiment just uh, uh, Joseph mentioned, this is a, a high-res experiment. We had a record high energy, it's a three times 10 to the 20 EV. So you see this uh, at least seven order of magnitude as a gap. That's why those guys are so interesting, okay? Many of uh, these uh, strategic uh, scientists, you know, always mentioned, uh, you know, many, many questions are still not solved by, you know, by us at uh, every, the beginning of the century, beginning of the decades, they always do this kind of things. Those, those num this numbers always make the list in this kind of uh, you know things. 
why these things are so difficult to be, you know, this uh, uh, origin is so difficult to, uh, to be, to be um, revealed? Problem is, all particles of, in cosmic rays, many just charged, pretty much just our, you know, nuclei. Those nuclei, once it is produced, passing through uh, something like, uh, you know, takes uh, a million of years to reach us, then those guys completely lost that direction original directional information. So you don't know once you measure the direction here, you cannot tell anything about this guy for sure, right? That's the reason we cannot find it. However, once this particle is produced immediately, there were some, you know, intermediate stuff uh, around the source. Then the immediately there was this kind of a process happened. Protons hit on those, uh, you know, uh, uh, particles, then generate uh, two things. One thing is a uh, uh, photons through pi zero decay immediately, then uh, those photons can go directly to, uh, to us. That's the very, very important issue, information. The other information is uh, going through uh, uh, the pi plus minus decayed into the muons. Then it generates neutrinos. Neutrinos can go directly to us as well, okay? So this gives us a chance. Uh, at least we can trace back to see where those guys could be, you know? And then we can do a more detailed analysis, uh, observations on this, on the sources. That's the first step where we should go. However, neutrino is really, really hard to detect. The, the, everybody knows that. So if you want to really do that, you probably need to build something like an ice cube, which is the one cubic kilometer detector. And then nowadays we found that it is not enough. Maybe we need 100 times of that to do the job like gamma ray astronomy. So that's why gamma ray astronomy in the last decades becomes so successful. They generate a lot of you know, interesting information. However, still not enough to allow us to, look to localize those guys uh, as the source of the cosmic ray. Of course, we mentioned the photons from them, then there is a competition interpretation of this, you know, process of generation uh, of photons, even for very, very high energy photons. Then how do we do this at the Earth? So one of the way is that when those particles at a high enough in, you know, uh, uh, energy, then once those guys hit into the, our atmosphere, will immediately interact with the uh, uh, nuclei of our atmosphere. Uh, hate, uh, uh, oxygen and uh, nitrogen, so those, those things, right? Immediately, the, the, pro the process is ex exactly the same as the process at the source, just as I mentioned before. So the particles immediately in our atmosphere generate a generation or generation of a secondary particles, make a shower of the particles, just like this. Once those particles, uh, you know, with the speed of light, fly down to the ground, make a, a perfect uh, front of what uh, we call the shower front here. And then none of those particles are hit on the ground. If you have the detectors on the ground, measure the timing of those particles hitting on, and also the number of the particles, then you calculate the energy of this shower of the original particles, then you get very, very information, a very imp important information. Now the question is how well you can do this, okay? If it is well enough, and then there's a perpendicular direction that will represent the direction of these primary particles coming down, can be used as the telescope to do the astronomy. That's the thing we are, we are trying to do. So how to do that? This is the one way to do as I described. Then you just build a big detectors on the ground, okay? Just build the array of the detectors. However, before we really get these things to be sensitive enough for good detection of the gamma rays, there is another technology which, uh, you know, won in the history. That is the chunk of telescope technolo uh, the technology. Those guys look at the uh, showers at, you know, once the shower is passing through particles, passing through the air, their speed actually is greater than the slight light of uh, the speed of light in the in the atmosphere, slightly, 
But uh, this is slightly difference allow us to generate 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 a uh, chunk of uh, chunk of light to the ground. So if you have a dish, uh, you know, optical dish to look at this kind of uh, you know direction and uh, to to take take this imaging of this shower, then this guy can watch very far away at the very beginning of this uh, you know shower de development. So that allow this kind of a detector to see the shower at a much lower energy than this guy's. That's why, you know, in the future, in the, in the, in the decades of uh, almost uh, three decades past, uh, those type of uh, experiment was not very, very uh, uh, successful, uh, has very tough magic, uh, generate a lot of uh, interesting physics. And then now at the 2006, I'm sorry, 2006, people get the idea to see uh, this detector is not good enough now. We should uh, have uh, something more sensitive, you know? So the idea come up uh, with the 100 at least telescopes putting together to build a huge array of the telescopes called the CTA, Chunkov Telescope Array. So that was uh, uh, the idea to cover the 10 square kilometer. That's just a huge area, right? And then uh, almost at the same time, uh, the three years later, we come up with the idea to build this thing as a ground array to do the similar thing, probably with a little bit higher energy, okay? So to try to reduce the energy as low as possible to match those guys, then we go to the high level, high altitude. And uh, those things had been finished at 2021, just not last year, um, so slightly, you know, just one year passed. That's the, the situation. Now let's get uh, into uh, uh, the lasso uh, uh, more detailed. So what the lasso today looks like, just this. This is an array of the detectors with 5,200 pieces of the detector. Each one you can see, barely see this little, you know, uh, five dots. And this is the area of the 1.3, uh, 1.36, uh, square kilometer, basically from here to here, uh, as the diameter is 1.3 kilometer. Uh, what is a geometrical location, uh, geographical location is uh, just the edge of uh, Qingdang Plateau at the altitude 4,410 meters above sea level. And uh, the distance to the, the, the major, uh, you know, major city, that, which is the Chengdu, is 20 million people's living in this city. There's something just like a, a 45 flight, 45 minutes of a flight. Okay. This is the one of the beauty for this, uh, for this experiment, for this side. Just cross uh, this direction, just a 15 meters, uh, 15 kilometers, we have uh, the highest several airport in the world. The height is exactly the same as this number. So you can directly fly to there and take uh, 10 minutes to reach our site, okay. So the, the detector itself, in the middle you can see there is a big a, a warehouse. This warehouse has the area of the uh, 78 square meter with the three pieces, one, two, and three. And those uh, 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 warehouse building is something like the five meters, uh, you know, the wall with a very, very big uh, roof to cover it. And the inside, we have a water chunk of detector. So before we go to the details, let me uh, introduce you our collaboration. Uh, I am the representative of this collaboration at the moment. We have uh, 275 people now uh, from uh, uh, six, uh, five countries, uh, 31 institutions uh, to join this uh, collaboration. The important thing is that uh, nowadays we are uh, in the so-called uh, uh, multi-messenger uh, era of the astronomy. So we made uh, uh, this uh, you know, network immediately. We signed the MOU with almost all the Chenkov telescopes co co uh, collaborations and also neutrino telescope uh, uh, collaborations, except uh, HESS here. HESS is in the totally different direction that this southern uh, hemisphere um, didn't share the, the same uh, uh, sky with us. So that's why we didn't have this uh, 
uh, collaboration with, with them currently. Maybe we are going to do that later, later. The detector itself just uh, localized this one. Inside uh, this uh, circle, as I mentioned, uh, from here to here is 1.3 uh, one, one kilometer with uh, little dots. The, uh, the, the red dots here is uh, totally 5,200 almost. Each one of them just look like this. It's a scintillator detect with the square, one square meter using fibers to read out and uh, to get the signal uh, from one single uh, PMT. This just give us the idea to measure the, how many numbers of particles are passing through the sky once the shower happened, and also uh, measure the timing with the accuracy of the one nanosecond or lower. This is the detector. And uh, then the most important part of this array is that uh, represented by those uh, square, uh, those uh, triangles here. In, in total, we have uh, uh, 1,188 pieces of this. This is an enormous thing. This guy is seven meter diameter, just uh, from here to there, probably. And uh, uh, 1.2 meter of depth was a pure water inside. And I put the one photo tube at the top and uh, to watch the chunk of once the particle is getting through, uh, this de detector to generate a water chunk of inside bouncing back, eventually reach to this, you know, to uh, this uh, uh, photo tube. Then you get uh, the idea how many lights you measured to count how many foot numbers particles passing through. However, this guy had been covered by 2.5 meters of dirt. Okay, so a big hump. Just uh, in the picture, you can see many many humps. Those humps uh, are absorb, absorbed, uh, absorbing electrons and photons completely, you know, by using the 2.5 meters of dirt, which is the cheapest stuff we can, we can get for in, in, in our Earth, right? So then uh, doing that, uh, make this detector so very, very clean, pure muon detector. Only muons can penetrate it down to this, uh, the, to this uh, detector. So that gives give us a chance to measure that we call the muon content. Muon content in a shower, that's just a very, very important piece of the instrument. By using this, we can do a very nice job to, uh, uh, to get the photons detected. Uh, the, in the central part of this water chamber, as I mentioned, this is a big warehouse. This is a, uh, just a five, five meter by five meter sails with a very big, such a big uh, photo tubes to try to measure the photons generated again in the water, five meter depths, and then we can um, detect the shower with a much lower energy, okay? How low, I can tell you. In the outside, we also built 18, this kind of telescopes, which are much smaller dishes comparing with the CTA dishes, which is, um, you know, five meter square to measure the very, very high energy cosmic rays. So by using this, we team up as a very nice just like uh, the, the high energy, uh, you know, uh, particle experiment, like uh, this uh, spectrometer to try to measure everything in the shower. Uh, and then you can get a very, very nice uh, idea about the shower. Let's see uh, how does this muon detector work and uh, how that is important to us. Here I just show you uh, two uh, examples. One is the very normal cosmic rays at the energy of 1 PeV, okay? Around the 1 PeV. If this is the normal shower that is generated by a proton, for example, then they immediately initiate this kind of a big shower with many, many pions, kions produced, right? Those guys are immediately uh, uh, you know, decayed into the muons. And then uh, during this decay generated a lot of muons. This muons, you see, can be detected by this muon detector, represented by these little circles. It's not so clear here, but you can you get an idea. So many of the number of muons detected being heat, and then the color just showed how many muons are actually detected by this, by each one of them. Another example is from the Crab Nebula. We know those guys generate photons, right? And also we get the idea if the energy is around the PEV, you, you see, how this guy is clean. If this is a photons coming in, the process is totally different. That is only e, e, e plus E minus pair product produced. And then those guys will initiate the same process. In the whole process, 
except it's a very, very small uh, cross-section of the so-called photo production to generate a little pions. Otherwise, you don't have chance to produce muon, okay, in the whole procedure. So that means if you look at those events compared with these guys, with a much, much less muons detected. So how, how, it, how, how less? This is a simulation, okay? You can see the, clearly there are two groups. This is a cosmic ray generated the muon numbers, and this is the gamma ray generated muon numbers. If you have a cut like that, then you can do a very clean work of uh, uh, separation of those uh, background. How good it is. This is the number of the cosmic rays we measured within the one degree from the crop direction, okay? If you don't do anything, you just measure it. Then uh, you count the energy, then you make this spectrum look like this. This energy is from 10 keV, from 10 keV to 1 PeV, okay, here. You see, this is the number of particles we measured. Once we do the cut, very, very simple cut, as the ratio of the number of muons measured by those bigger guys, you know, seven meter diameter bigger guys, and the number of the electrons measured by the little guys, uh, the 5,000 pieces in the, in, the, in the field, then we get this uh, you know, very, very simple cut. If you do this at the 100 TeV level, the, those number becomes this guy. And the, at the 500 TeV above, this number becomes uh, you know, 10 to the minus five less left. Okay, now you draw, you know, you, you can measure the photons now. You measure the photons uh, 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 flux of the crop nebula that's at here. So this is a very clean, you know, it's the background background free almost measurements for the for the for the photon. That's why this muon detector is so important, right? And we can do the one thing even nice even nicer with the muscle uh, setup, because as I said, we have this uh, photo uh, chunk of telescopes, uh, 18 of them built up there, and uh, those guys are in charge of uh, uh, cosmic ray measurement at a very high threshold, for example, like 100 TeV or a few tens of TeV. Once these guys opened, of course, if you have photons generated showers, they can, they can see them, no, no doubt, right? Very, very lucky. That's the same event I just showed you as an example. This guy is happened in the night. That means one of the detectors must see it, okay, see this event. So that's happened. This guy actually looked the same direction of this shower. You see, we measured this imaging of this event. That's give us a very good chance to cross check with the energy measurement, at least. So. Very nicely, we found that this energy agreed with each other slightly. This guy, because it's too far away, the uncertainty is slightly larger, but uh, the measurement agree with each other very well. So one is from the ground, another is from this uh, image. Okay. Uh, what I missed? Oh, this could be missed. It will be skipped. Uh, the, now the operation of this detector is. A, it's a very, very stable. And uh, you know, this detector, basically, you don't have to, to take care. You let it uh, go alone. Huh? This is a very uh, simple operation. So that's why we can keep such a high duty cycle, um, day and time, day and night. This, for this, is the water, water chunk of detector. And we keep the something record as a 98.4% of duty cycle, 24 hours. And every day we get the event like this. Uh, three billion events uh, recorded by this guy. This, those guys generate a lot of uh, you know, data, huge amount of data. And then uh, another one is this uh, uh, ground array outside the, you know, in the air. And this guy, even, even better. They have 99% of the duty cycles operated, except it was hit by something really bad. Yes, not just a few days ago, I got a lot of report. That's really bad. Make damages. Two hundreds of detectors being hit by a, by a, by a thunder. And then, uh, you know, uh, you have to send a team to repair it. That's, that's the knife. Just take a couple of days, you see. This is a big drop of this uh, uh, duty cycle. Otherwise, this detector is operated very well. And uh, this is... Uh, 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 the, the, the chunk of telescope. 
this this uh, this area is not so nice for this kind of experiment because you if you can saw the picture before was ever green uh, the, the green area which it means there is a lot of rain in the summertime which is not friendly for the, this kind of measurements so we have some kind of monsoon started at the, moon, at the may of the year so just before the monsoon started we have a whole winter <laughs> As a beautiful night every every day. Now currently we are operating, so basically you can turn on your detector for ten hours or eleven hours even every day to do the measurement. So you you can reach something like one one thousand four hundred days uh, hours per year. This is a typical. It's already not so bad for the measurements. Oh, now let's go uh, get into some science. Uh, first of all. Let's talk about uh, 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 crab labella. Crab is a uh, one, you know, very very interesting one, because this is the almost the only one, the first one at least, uh, recognized by human beings, record uh, in words. Okay, this is Chinese. At the uh, year ten fifty four, the people found that, that night suddenly there is a new star showed up, so they called the they call the guest star, you know, because this is a guest. Only for 28 days, something so bright, brighter than Jupiter. In the even in the daytime, you can see that guy is hanging out, hanging on. So that is the one recorded. And nowadays we recognize that as the first recognized supernova remnants, supernova uh, exposure. And nowadays, of course, it's a remnants. And the inside we have a labula. Those guys generate a very very high energy star. How high I will tell you, and uh, the the middle of this is a uh, powered by a uh, pulsar. There's very powerful pulsar with a very very strong spin down energy to 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 power everything. Uh, so this guy is so far away. So basically, that gives us uh, just a perfect the point source in co according to our angular resolution. So that means uh, we can use that to do calibration, and this becomes uh, one of the standard candle to us. To do this kind of calibration, for one thing, which is the location. If you are detector doing well, you know, pointing uh, to the correct direction. So we found that this pointing accuracy. If you look at the position here, to 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 compare with uh, other, you know, very accurate the measurement like optical, then you can get to the idea. So this is something that better than zero 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 point zero one degree. And then uh, as a point source, if you measure the size of this uh, spot, and then it give you an idea about uh, how your resolution is, how, how well you can measure the skies. So we found at the energy of this region, and uh, uh, we have something like uh, uh, 0 0.2 degree. And once you get in the energy higher, this is another order of magnitude higher, the 10 TV level, then uh, this number becomes a little bit worse because the uh, you know, ground array with the spacing of the 50 meters of the detector, then you reach something like a 0.3. Once you go higher energy at 100 TV, there's another order of magnitude, then you get a better, something like a 0.15 degree of the uh, uh, resolution. Of course, we check the uh, energy spectrum. Uh, this is the flux of the photons you measured. Uh, before, uh, we know the 100 TV, and we have already a lot of measurements. As I mentioned, there's a chunk of detectors, right? Uh, Veritas, um, Magic, and uh, those uh, the Hass detectors. So we have totally here seven of them measure this spectrum. So we can cross-check. We can check with us to see if uh, we did the correct job or not. So it seems to be way enough, okay? More interestingly, there is a one point, if you see this a blue circle, blue squares represent the water chunk of detector at the low energy part. And uh, this uh, red, blue, red squares is represented as all the you know, uh, ground array at the high energy part. Then uh, there is a one point here which has the overlap with each other. Let's give you another chance to check if our detector agree with each other uh, way enough. So it seems to be OK here. Huh? Um, more exciting, of course, is beyond the 100 TeV. This is new era. This is what I mean, the ultra high energy gamma ray astronomy. Just, uh, you know, if you have the couple of the events measured, you cannot do the astronomy. Now you have the whole spectrum, okay? 
to cover the energy range all the way from 100 TeV to the few PeV. That's the first time people opened this window, then they start to, to see something interesting, okay? If you look at it carefully, this spectrum is somehow follows a very strict uh, power law, which means this process is not as we expected before. People expected some kind of a cutoff here uh, with the you know, maximum energy being accelerated in the world, in the universe, as, a, as a something like a 100 TeV. So now we know this is not true, okay? This is spectrum must go through all, all the way to the 100, uh, to, to 1 PeV. If you look very closely, you will see something maybe more interesting at the end. This spectrum maybe have some kind of, you know, a race up like the hardening. This guy is well, 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 uh, uh, you know, detected. And by, for example, like Chandra, make a very nice picture inside of the, you know, the, 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 the nebula to see that this beautiful structure. And I just give you the chance if we measure the highest energy of the 1.1 PeV photons, we made a very simple calculation, you know, to figure out the size of this thing, of the, if you have an accelerator to accelerate electrons, okay? Then uh, this size cannot be smaller than those guys, 0 0.025 PC, which is the size of this lot in the ring, okay? Then uh, we don't expect that this guy's too far away from this kind of structure, so maybe we get some idea about 0 0.18 PC is the size, you know, between these two sizes is something happened which generated this high energy uh, photons. And uh, this thing is uh, basically setting uh, some kind of, uh, you know, challenge to us. Because now if you have the 1.1 PeV measured, if it is produced by electrons, you know, those guys are doing a very, very nice job you can use the one group of the electron or pevatrons to, to, to explain this guy over 22 order of magnitude of the spectrum. That's a very, very you know, impressive. However, if this is electrons generated in this guy at the highest energy, then there's a number of the, uh, uh, the energy of this electron must be 2.3 PeV. Remember, at the LHC, people generated the electron before, which is 100 GeV, GeV, okay? Now you are talking about uh, 2.3 PeV electrons. So how can you do that? How can this guy, little guy, can do this stuff? That's the huge question to us, okay? It, because, you know, the very huge of the energy loss rate of electron positrons, then you have the, uh, you, you can estimate a lot of things, which is so-called the acceleration rate. Okay, that means you have to pump the energy to these electrons very quickly. You know, if you you are not doing this good job, then the energy is lost. You can get no no chance to accelerate the electrons to such high. So how high it is? It is something like the fifteen percent already. One is the limit. You know, you are going to break the limit if you measure this guy is something like a three point five degree uh, PeV. Then that's in trouble. Okay, so at this number it's already something like a factor of a thousand larger than the normal uh, shock wave acceleration rate. So that's is definitely is a limit, it's a sort of, uh, you know, challenge to us. So people nowadays are talking about this, if there is electrons, then that could be a so-called so extreme elect, uh, accelerator. This, why it is extreme? This is an extreme, okay? This is something people getting really interested. However, Probably, as I mentioned, there was some kind of a raising part of uh, this uh, spectrum at the tip, of the tip of the high energy. So that may give us some chance. If you look very, very closely, actually, this is not true. The explanation by using the electrons may get some kind of a, a deviation from our measurements. Okay. So now people just raise the question: If we have another component here, probably it's generated by proton. Then no. Oh, the knife becomes much simpler. If it is a proton, then you don't worry about how could you accelerate the particles too high. It's not this high, it's even higher. It's even higher, right? It's something like a 10 PeV for protons, but that doesn't bother us. Protons are much easier being accelerated, okay? So 
then you can release, uh, relaxing this tension uh, as the highest energy particles. Those guys are not generating the photon. Uh, electrons anymore by proton. If you add uh, such a you know little component here, then you have a much much better uh, you know the the comparison between data and the model. Uh, every every point are uh, touched this uh, prediction by uh, in, within the one sigma. This seems to be a very very nice uh, explanation. Okay, if we ever have these things, that would be very very interesting because. We are looking for cosmic ray origins, right? Here, here it is. If you really can prove that this is a proton contribution, then this can give us the idea how, you know, our galactic source generated the PEV protons, or even 10 PEV protons, to our cosmic ray spectrum. If it is enough to explain the whole thing, this is a question to the theoreticians to ask. You know, they can make a calculation to figure out if it is enough to to explain the whole spectrum of cosmic rays. And then that's may not be necessary because we not only proton, uh, uh, crab labella, we also found uh, 12 of them, those kind of uh, so called pavatrons, line up in our galaxy. Okay, very simple measurement, as I mentioned. Once you do this kind of a muon cut, you get a whole bunch of photons, right? You collect the photons. Once you collect the photons with uh, uh, some number like this at uh, above the 100 TeV, 530 photons, then uh, you know the direction of those photons. You throw that into the sky to see how, how it looks like. If it is uh, completely uniform or isotopic or just grouped up, grouped together. Mm, it is grouped. Group the within the twelve positions. Okay, those give us the list of these twelve pavatrons. Why these pavatrons? Of course, if you measure the, something like you know one hundred TeV photons, if, no matter it is uh, electrons or protons generated them, those uh, particles must be accelerated higher than one PeV. That's why we call this pavatrons. Okay, be 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 very uh, conservative. We make this selection of the 12 guys using a rather high standard. Not a five sigma, but we use a seven sigma to do this cut. And the rejection power reached to a 10 to the minus four. Okay, so now we get the idea about this. Interesting enough, you know, people believe uh, supernova remnants must be the you know, very good candidates for cosmic rays as a source. However, if you, Go through this list, and uh, if I have this, okay. This is the list here. Uh, this is the uh, sky map here, more scientifically. You can see the location very well to, to agree with the long sources, okay? Oh, except only one here without any uh, uh, company. Then, uh, so otherwise, so other, other guys, so you know exactly which you know, sources may associate with this guy, okay? With this power trans, you found that you know, supernova remnants actually is a pretty small population which contributed to this 12 sources. But you have many other things. For example, like a pulsar nebula, but like this uh, massive star uh, clusters, and there's something very interesting stuff. A binary, maybe, yeah? This is the um, bigger group here working on the binaries, okay? So that's Open the, suddenly open the windows. You, you see a lot of stuff there. You don't have to you know, think very badly to, to think of the, how the uh, you know, supernova remnants to accelerate the particles go such high. Now you have many things to think. That's good. That's open, the, open our mind, okay? So we published a couple of the spectrums. You see, nicely I uh, have this kind of uh, uh, power law uh, above 100 TeV. And then also we found the new sources here. Okay, uh, and the one of this guy is so called the, the pulsar uh, halo is the you know one of the a lot of one, um, and also we found some other places maybe you know where we we'll get the idea about the cosmic ray or uh, accelerations. Okay, so proton uh, the crab labella is the one guy very good, and also now we have many things to look. Okay, maybe get a better chance to find the source. Another topic. 
Now, by using, as I mentioned, by using this uh, Cherenkov telescopes together, then we can do a lot of uh, uh, higher energy cosmic ray measurement. Why it is so important? Because at the energy range of the uh, 10 to the 15, there is a famous structure of the spectrum called the knee. Huh? This gives us a somehow very, very uh, important information about if it is due to the highest energy being accelerated in, in our galaxy. This is always the question to us. Now, probably we get a better idea. The uh, supernova remnants can generate this kind of lower energy part. Maybe some other guys will represent of, uh, rep to be re re responsible for this high energy part. Then what do we need is to measure this cosmic ray spectrum again with a much, much better you know, uh, accuracy. For example, if you can do, you should uh, separate the protons out. You give us the proton shape of the D, and then you separate the ion out. You get the, 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 the knee of the structure of uh, ions experiment, uh, the spectrum. And of course, we can do uh, many other physics, okay? Uh, when I produced this, uh, uh, prepared this uh, slice, we don't know we can do this yet. But now, by using this one guy, one event, we can do a lot of this physics with the GRB. You know, one of the, your colleague, uh, colleagues of uh, uh, Resmit in the magic group, he yesterday, he sent an email to me, said that, you know, once you mention this event, actually, that are worth it for a whole lot of projects already. <laughs> you don't worry about anything else. You know, just get this event. So, uh, of course, we can do uh, many other things, including very interesting to do uh, this uh, testing uh, with the very high energy photons to uh, 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 Lawrence uh, invariance uh, to see if it is breaked, okay, at such a high energy with the photons, then you can do something. So, I, I probably have this slide here. Yes, this is uh, one of the tests we have done by using this uh, 1.4 PeV photon at uh, the distance we know is something around 1.4 kilo per sec. And uh, then uh, you can do the very simple calculation to see if uh, Lorentz invariance is, broke, is broken, then uh, you don't expect uh, those events, right? Because uh, gamma in the way from there to here is already decayed. The two channels, the first channel is this called the U plus U minus at the first order with a very high uh, probability. So that means this guy, uh, you know, already measured by many other event uh, experiment, uh, this already the energy scale is higher than Planck scale. So basically it's a root out. There is no such thing at this energy level. Now the, uh, uh, Lasso just make this energy higher, raised by a one or so, the, uh, the order of magnitude. But the second order still there, this, the, the highest energy we checked, still three order of magnitude to the Planck scale. So that means the, you know, the second order of the, the violation is still there. You can, you can, you, you can, you can uh, test again, test this more to see if it is still the uh, you know, possibility, right? Okay, now let's, uh, let's almost, uh, I, I give you the story about the science. Let me uh, switch a little bit to the technology part, okay? To do to this uh, um, very big detectors and also uh, to try to reach as the lowest energy of uh, uh, the threshold, basically the idea was to try to catch the GRBs, okay? because there were so many, many GRBs so you don't expect us to have a so, so high energy. So you reduce your threshold energy is necessary. So that's why we introduced this big guy. This guy is really enormous. With a, such a big uh, 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 photo tubes, within the five meter by five meter, just like this big, then this guy can generate, a, uh, can catch the very, very faint uh, signal. So by adding that, our detector was designed by using eight, eight inch tube like that. And now we can reach to this, this line. And then that shows that at the 70 TV, we have the similar uh, sensitivity as a, as a, as a, as a 
uh, Fermi net, okay? Which means once we have that the energy uh, that level, we got the sensitivity there, then we should have this gamma ray burst being detected. However, this detected uh, effective area is enormous, it's much larger, something like 100 square meter, comparably with the one, one meter square of, uh, uh, of uh, Fermi. So that means that's why we have so many photons being detected. If you don't have such a sensitivity, you don't see it. Hmm? Once you see it, you must have an enormous number of particles. Otherwise, you don't see it. That's a very simple idea. So that's why this time when we see it, of course, this guy is too, too bright, okay? So everybody saw it. And then now you, can, you get a lot of, lot of the photons measured. Now they beautifully give you the light curves very, very smoothly, you know, very, very tiny details, you know, details of the, 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 the light curves. You can start it, start it with them. So this is the good part. This is 20 inch cubes. Another cutting edge uh, technology we used is uh, actually uh, the, the so-called uh, white rabbit uh, protocol. This is open source, uh, initiated by some people. They try to measure, you know, the synchronize the clocks around the, the tunnel, around the, the, you know, the, the, the pipeline. So you, 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 you don't miss it up. Otherwise, you, you will measure the something faster than, fast, faster than the speed of light, you know, like the, the, like the, 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 the <laughs> The neutrinos, right? So you got to be careful. You, your clock must be right. Right? You, 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 that's that's the, that's the idea. And then one of the uh, this is because it's open source. I remember this is one of the span uh, a Spanish company produced this uh, uh, first or first version of this uh, this uh, this uh, switches. That's a very interesting part. And then uh, at that time, the, the synchro 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 Synchronization uh, accuracy of these clocks is something around one nanosecond, which is almost enough for the, for the, for the, for the, uh, uh, you know, allow to you to don't to go higher than the speed of light, right? So, but the way it's not a good for us yet. So we do the some kind of, uh, uh, you know, because it's open source, you just do it, and we just did some development on this. Now, the the, the timing. The timing accuracy is down to something like a 250 picosecond, which is necessary for us because our detector is only five meters away from each other. Okay, so we needed this kind of uh, accuracy. That's the one thing we did. Now, other thing is a DAQ system. This DAQ system, uh, as my knowledge, is the first time we used uh, this so called the Trigonis uh, technology. Basically, we got every hit from our detect. On the stream as a stream of the heats put into our computer, we built a very powerful computer system at 4,400. You know, almost no people there, so we have a huge, uh, something like more than 10, 10 kilo, uh, 10,000 cores in this uh, uh, system. We can do a very quick calculation for the you know to decide which kind of a trigger you want. Everybody can set their tri triggers there on this. Uh, you know, we keep the data, this raw data, for five seconds. Then that's good enough for people to do everything. Uh, there you go. Oh, another very interesting uh, technology is this uh, silicon PM. Okay, this is uh, something I really wanted to share with you. This is uh, something uh, uh, for people just in the life, uh, the lifetime work of to do this kind of telescope things by using it. Silicon PM as the pixel of this camera, that make uh, this life of those guys to do this uh, color, uh, you know, telescope measurement so easy, because this detector is really robust. If you share the light directly uh, on this detector, there will doesn't damage this guy. Okay, so that means we can run it with the full moon. Even the full moon is directly shares light into our detector. We don't care. We just turn off the you know. The, the 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 high voltage for a moment. Once this guy the moon move out from the field of view, then we switch the uh, high voltage uh, on again. Then we can do this measurement. That's why we can do a very nice, uh, you know, that's accumulation of the hours per year. So then uh, now by doing so, we at least increase uh, the the factor of two of our effective time, effective uh, operation time, the duty cycle. That's it.
that's about uh, you know bring me uh, to the conclusion. Basically, this de detector as the status is already finished, it's done uh, uh, in uh, uh, next uh, in the July of last year, and now we found uh, not even built, we finished the constru uh, construction. We already found something interesting. Uh, and so pavatrons and also the highest energy guys from uh, 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 from a signals region, uh, and then uh, give us a very big chance to see the cosmic ray origins now. Okay, and also we are going to uh, to do the measurements of the uh, cosmic ray spectrum very precisely to, to basically to 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 draw this kind of a Lee shape of the cosmic rays. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, with such a high, you know, uh, this energy and the statistics allow us to do sort of, uh, you know, very, very fundamental rules to be checked, uh, like uh, this Lorentz invariance. Okay, so prospectives. Um, very soon, we're going to publish something really interesting stuff. For example, like this is OB2, uh, uh, around the OB2 region. And we will say uh, probably give us a very nice, you know, idea about the cosmic rays. Also, we are looking for uh, this uh, uh, actual galactic stuff. Um, but uh, you know, we saw those guys periodically produce very, very high energy stuff. But so far, we haven't got a chance yet. We want to see something, you know, again above 20 TV, uh, 30 TV. That will excite people again. Huh? This uh, just like this GRB this time, the 18 TV stuff. So we are waiting for that. And uh, another one very, very interesting topic actually is about this diffuse gamma rays. Okay. Because, you know, there's a very nice uh, separation power between uh, photon versus cosmic, cosmic ray background actually uh, give us a chance to measure this uh, uh, diffuse gamma rays in our galaxy. That's give us a lot of information about uh, the po particles propagation and, uh, you know, stuff. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Xiao, for your talk, for the nice talk. It's time for questions. I'll take questions now. Please. New very bright gamma ray, uh, gamma ray burst. Um, you, you said it had um, a red shift about 0 0.15. How, 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 do you, how would you estimate that? It's not a me. It's not our job. It's not your job. No, it's not our job. No. It's the astronomers. They it's did not, this. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 they, right. saw, they saw other stuff. Yeah, they yeah, could yeah. Use yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Right. We cannot do that. No. Okay. Yes. Please. Well, uh, I'm an astronomer. <laughs> I may answer that question. <laughs> like normally, you take an optical spectrum, and then you can see some host absorption lines. Either the the GRB spectrum shows some lines, but normally that's like less likely. But then the host lines are visible, so then you can estimate the redshift. But uh, yeah, I have uh, some questions. Yeah, very interesting. Um, well, uh, maybe one of my questions about the data processing, because you mentioned that you save the data for five seconds and then you have like 10 to the nine events per day or something like that. So how, how do you decide when something is significant? And like, are you able to release like real time alerts about uh, new detections? Yeah, uh, basically, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a bit, it's a question of noise, right? So when you measure this shower, actually your detector is opened then you get a bunch of noises. So now you, you got to be careful. You have to have the algorithm to, to select events, OK? So this is selection basically is try to figure out, for example, like a timing versus distance, sort of distance, no matter respect to what. But you, know, you should have some kind of a shape, like a liner shape, right, or curved. But then maybe you save some events which are suspicious to be real, and then you like uh, eyeball them to the not an eyeball, to... yeah. But of course, you know, the the, the 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 three billion of events you cannot buy your eyeball, yeah. But you have to have some algorithm to run through those. Set. Right, but not to waste, or not to throw away this data, right? Because after five Before seconds, the, you say within the five like... second, within the five second, you can do whatever you want. Right, but to... then you you store whatever you think is no, real. No, throw it away. After five seconds, you throw away everything. And you already pick out what you want. You know, those events, you say, oh, good, I save it. Oh, good, save it. 
and otherwise yes but what do you say you you still have to go through like more checks right oh like, yeah of course yeah, okay. this is a, a finer this is a much much finer analysis you know to do just like a, you know everybody else right, but do. then that means that you don't release like real-time alerts so basically you save things which could be real and then let's say it takes a whole checking process which may take like days to weeks to decide that something is real right Thank you. As much as we can save those events. Yeah. Okay, uh, one question about this uh, uh, spectrum, the Crab Nebula spectrum. Uh, what uh, can Lars say in the future about this possible um, patterning of the spectrum and contribution of photons? Uh, do you expect this to be significant in a few years or, 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 right. or, or do we need a um, larger detector or what? what? How, how do you foresee to, to answer the, this, this question? Um, you know, at the very, very beginning time, we are very, very op, uh, optimistic about these things. Um, probably now we re realize that once you have the one year of data, you know things. Something like the one, uh, one PV event per year. That's a, about the rate. Okay? So if you really want to deal with that last point, you have to wait for a couple of years. That's the policy currently our, you know, uh, our collaboration take. So we'll wait. We're not going to touch this piece of uh, you know, physics for a while. Just uh, wait for a couple of years, probably we'll get an idea. If we don't still get an idea, then probably we shouldn't need a bigger one, right? For example, if we, we, we really get, uh, you know, nowadays we are talking about this uh, South uh, SWGO things. The um, idea is that uh, to build another lasso at the south. Then we get a lot of chance to see more things, including uh, something very similar to uh, crab. And then we hope we can get some, uh, you know, better idea. The size in our mind at least the twice of the lasso. Okay. But for sure, take a years. Yeah, take a years. It's not a month. No. Right. Hi. Uh, the 12 pev pevatron Pevatons. you chose was sort of a flux limited sample. And they, they, are, they are all in galactic sources, but uh, they are located in different distances. So, in terms of luminosity, which is the most uh, powerful, uh, powerful sources among the 12? You mean the luminosity of what? I, I don't get the qu question. What is the luminosity about? Luminous, most luminous object in among the twelve. Oh, most all. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, this is a question. Probably I cannot answer you directly immediately. Something probably this. Uh, uh, Twenty. Uh, 1825 probably is the brightest one. Yeah, probably. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Do, do you know the, the nature of these sources? Because, I mean, if if yeah. they are not stars where we have a distance, uh, you don't yeah. really know what they yeah, are. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have. Uh, yeah, we, we sort of know them, but uh, not, uh, not completely. Uh, they were at least it's in our so-called uh, TV catalog, okay? As I mentioned, this guy here, this one. Right. And do they have like radio counterparts or optical counterparts? Yeah. We, now this is a big job. We go one by one of them, right? Of course, we, this is a, the, the big job to, to, to go. But, uh, you know, at least if you look at this uh, blue circle, okay, this is uh, from uh, uh, the TV catalog. So this is already we have, uh, we, we, we know there was at least a, Except that this one, we have a count counterparts of those guys. So if you go to the uh, TV catalog, you can see people made a lot of, uh, you know, already did a job, right? Already done job. But you can see the all of those guys has a sort of association with something. The problem right now is uh, probably you have too many associations. Okay, you have uh, at least uh, I, I I can list them. You know, three of guys, uh, the one of the is probably is a post window nebula and the nearby with uh, you know the 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 uh, uh, supernova remnants 
and some crowds and some stuff, and now you have to make a decision. Which one is that? Which one resp responsible for this kind of high energy uh, radiation? Right. This is a lot of level of the you know work of a job. Mm -hmm. So sure, we have in the same paper in this paper. I, I should have the reference down somewhere. We have a list of the associations, one by one. You can you can check. You can see there are many many things associated with these guys, post up with nebulas and uh, you know this stuff. Right. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. In the, in the spectrum of the spectrum of the crab the crab nebula uh, there is the, the low energy component that is synchrotron emission and the high energy component is inverse compton inverse compton scattering and then there is uh, the addition of the maybe the the proton yes in, in case of the the inverse compton this is from external photons or uh, the synchrotron self compton has been taken also into account is to say the inverse Compton component, the high energy. Sure, this one. Uh, uh, this guy. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, in this case, uh, okay, here is the, the synchrotron self Compton, but. Yeah, this is synchrotron part. Yes. Yeah, but yeah. this thing this probably is due to a flare, the, the famous uh, crab flare. So we don't really worry about this, uh, this yeah. part, okay? Yeah, this is very well done. And uh, somebody did this uh, actually. Uh, uh, I should have that figure. Let, let me see if it's in the spare. There is a there is a figure to show this very nicely. Here, you see, uh, people did, uh, did this very nice job, uh, but by using the one group of the electron positrons, those energies. Uh, if uh, the electron di distribution just like less than one PV, that generates this part of the synchrotron. And if uh, the energy is one PV, then they generate this part of the synchrotron. Okay. And uh, simultaneously, this same group of the electrons will work down the job to do this uh, inver inverse uh, inverse uh, uh, competent scattering. Then they generate a similar thing. Now, this this part of the electrons generated this part of the spectrum Fermi. Okay. This part of the electrons generated the part of a lasso. That's it. All right. Uh, more questions? So uh, again, about this um, PV part of the crap spectrum, um, I, I was thinking, did someone check what could be the energetics to produce through proton-proton interactions in this uh, part of the spectrum around PV energies, because if I am not mistaken, I believe that since you don't have so many stuff around the source, you will need quite a lot of proton energy to produce uh, these luminosities through proton-proton interactions. You, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't quite get a question. You mean uh, too many stuff or too less stuff Probably. have? I mean, since the, the environment of the crop, it's not very, very dense. You need uh, quite a lot of oh, you mean materialistic the, protons to produce you the, mean the target. The targets are not... You mean not, the target. You don't have a target, you mean. You don't, maybe you don't have enough targets, right? Enough. The, the, the ejector is still there, right? Ejector is still there. The, the, the labula. Uh, the the, the, the labula. The, the supernova yeah, labula yeah. still there. 1,000 years is not too long. Stuff is still there. And did, did someone estimate the energetics you need to produce this part of the spectrum through proton-proton interactions? Uh, you know, because this flux is very, very small, actually. I, I, I didn't do this calculation, but uh, I, I'm sure somebody already done this job. It's simple, same as to me, it's not really an issue. Okay. Uh, one of the guys should be a very, very good expert is... Uh, uh, and in a, and in a Amato, this group, you, your colleagues here, yeah, you can you can you can check with uh, with this group. I'm sure there was no problem to generate such a no flux. It's not an enormous flux. You know, if we're talking about this part, is contributed the proton, then your question is right. Yeah, that's is a big issue. But if you're talking about only this small portion of the flux, it's okay. All right. Okay. 
If there is no more questions, we thank again uh, Professor Zhao. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We expect it because, <laughs> no, because sometimes there is uh, also another speaker also with uh, stone level like you, uh -huh. but maybe they are talking uh, with uh, just thinking in the people is expert in, in the subject. Yeah, yeah. yeah we try it. Uh, the level that you did is very good. Okay, also, good, good. Very good. Uh -huh. very good. People can so under people can understand. Sometimes uh, there is some frustration in the organizers because they say, okay, this was a very specific uh, uh -huh. topic, very, yeah. topic, very narrow. So, yeah. uh, in this case, it was, it was very fine because good. this is a problem that is uh -huh. Okay, good. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, I know. Very nice audience, actually. They have a lot of. The young, young guys. Didn't ask question. This is a. Yeah, so this is normal. This is normal. They this, are very shy. This is, this is normal. I mean, they are not used to ask questions. It's a meeting, but I'm like. Mm. So we, we try to. You should encourage them. Yeah, we yeah. try to encourage them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Especially. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. This, uh, 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 oh, this, okay. This yes, one. yes. This one. I have a ten off. Yeah, you know, my experience is that undergraduate students actually have more questions than graduate students.